Yes, can we see that? No, we can't see that. Yes, we can see that, yes. Right, first, uh, first job done. So, yeah, um, I'm Dave, hi. Um, so I'm gonna be trying to answer the question, um, what's the best tool for writing Hadoop jobs? Because there's all sorts of Hadoop tools out there um, for MapReduce things. It's Hive Cascading, Scolding, Scrunch, Crunch, Scooby, there's probably more of them I can't remember right now, but um, yeah, they quite often get presented to you in a way that's like, this is the best one to use for all occasions because someone has spent a lot of time working on it. They've spent a lot of time telling people that it's the best way, they've thought about it, and uh, and they're convinced their approach is the best one, but people don't often do a kind of objective review of what's actually good and bad about each one and what situation you might want to use use them in. So that's kind of the uh, the target for this, is to try and get a more objective review of of the things you can do in them and why it might be a good or a bad idea. So, what is the best tool for writing Hadoop jobs? Well, there's no magic bullet. There isn't one. Um, as far as I can tell from the research I've done, there's, uh, there's no uniform best thing to, to use to write your MapReduce jobs. Um, there are good ones, there are less good ones, there are good ones in certain situations, but um, there's no best one. So if someone tries to tell you there's a best one, they're probably lying. Um, so, plain old MapReduce, we have loads of it around at Spotify. We're trying to cut back on it. We have it written in Python, um, going by Hadoop Streaming. And that's kind of been okay for a little while. Um, certainly when big data was first starting up at Spotify, that seemed like the sensible thing to do. There's a lot of code at Spotify written in Python. Um, and then plugging that into MapReduce seemed like the obvious thing to do. But there are a few problems with that. Um, so MapReduce code can be quite verbose if you're expressing something quite simple. Um, it can suffer with testability if you've got multiple MapReduce stages happening in a, in a row. You've got things flowing into other things. It can be difficult to try and test that effectively. You suffer with optimization because sometimes computers can do a better job of working out when to optimize stuff than humans can. And if the computer only has the instructions in MapReduce format, then it can't decide, I don't need these fields, I'm going to check, away them, check them away earlier. It can't make intelligent um, inferences about what the intent of the person was and how that can be optimized. Um, it can suffer with performance, specifically in our case, as we're going via Hadoop streaming. You've got a Java, you've got a JVM on each Hadoop node, streaming into Python, streaming out of Python again. Python has mixed reviews for its performance. Um, it's, you can speed it up, but it's, it's a bottleneck, certainly. Um, IDE support, I mean, if you're using untyped languages or splitting strings and trying to send them into mappers and reducers, um, you can't really get any extra help from your IDE. All you've got is implement this mapper, implement this reducer, and that's all you all you have to work with. And the uh, I've said pre-execution confidence, which is kind of a, a kind of general term that encompasses something some of the ideas to do with IDE support and some of the ideas to do with testability. Just generally knowing that when you run something on your Hadoop cluster, it's not going to fall over. Um, we have a problem with that at Spotify as well that there's quite a lot of jobs that run there that just fail because people haven't tested them or they've not thought about some edge case that might happen. So um, we want to kind of minimize that as a possibility. So in other languages, other high level um, abstractions built on top of MapReduce, such as the ones I'm going to go through today, we can have uh, lots of cool features, which you don't have if you're just writing MapReduce jobs as they are. You can have uh, high-level operations like filtering and joining and aggregation, which is kind of a more natural language to speak about data processing in. Certainly more familiar if you work with collections at a smaller level. You can have type safety, which I'm a big fan of. Um, the Python world does not appreciate type safety, but they're wrong. Um, <laughs> You can have uh, super easy testing. Some of these things will allow testing in a, in a way that like, there's no excuse not to do it. Um, and if you allow testing in that kind of way, then people are actually going to do their testing, which is really important. Uh, we can have things integrated to the, into the language itself, so you don't have to learn any 
um, extra weirdness. It just feels familiar, which goes with the last thing, which is the familiar interfaces. If you know SQL, you can work with Hive. If you know how collections work, you can work with Crunch. That kind of idea. So with that as a thing that we want to achieve, there are several different attempts at achieving it. And kind of some of them, well, each of them gets a certain way to doing it, but none of them's perfect. So cascading family. Um, it's actually been around for quite a while, um, and it's kind of evolved a little bit over time, um, but it's got kind of its own weirdnesses as well. I call it the tuple, tuple pipeline model. So um, it's all based on tuples of values flowing through these pipelines. So the key concepts here are the tuple, which is just um, named fields and values for each of those fields. Those fields are untyped, so you have kind of no guarantee of what's going to be in any of these fields. Um, you have source taps and sync taps. Source taps are where you can get tuple streams from. Sync taps are where tuple streams go. Um, you have pipes, which are conceptually what tuples can flow through and get modified by. The pipes are assembled into assemblies. The assembles are assembled into flows. And the flows begin and end at taps. And then if you compose multiple flows into a cascade, and it does a certain amount of dependency resolution um, to figure out what to run first and what to run next. Does that make any sense at all? I'm getting a few blank looks. There's a lot of content and it goes quite fast. So, <laughs> um, but do stop me if you're if you're really lost. Um, so, yeah, um, and these pipes that I mentioned, they they correspond with something that might be a bit a little bit more familiar if you know how MapReduce works. So there's an each pipe which takes a tuple and emits zero or more tuples based on some kind of operation. There's a group by that takes a certain field in your tuple and groups by, by that, and that means you can flow into an every pipe, which operates on all the tuples for a certain key that have been emitted by a group by pipe. Um, there's a co-group pipe, which is probably more familiar as a MapReduce join, and a hash join, which is load in one data set and join it hashed with the other one. Um, and these all, there's, there's no guarantee at construction time that the, that the assembly you've built is a valid one, which is kind of one of the limitations of cascading. So you'll see in the example pipeline, which is what I'm going to be demonstrating all the different tools with. Um, so this is kind of a pretend scenario from Spotify. You've got a track played message with a track ID, username, timestamp. Sounds like an obvious thing to have. The real one has a lot more fields, but um, this, is, this is simplified. We have some user info, so a username, country, subscription level, whether they're paying us or not. Um, we have some track metadata, and title and artist to the track. And what we want to output in this particular case is something called artist country streams, which is the number of streams by an artist in a country for whatever date range you give the input data for. So. There's a lot of code in this presentation, so you'll you'll have to try your best to follow. I'm gonna explain it as well as I can. So this is this is it coded up in cascading. So you've got these fields declarations here. Um, they kind of explain the schema of what you're working with. So these are the the fields that represent the input schema. And as you can see, they're just string identifiers for each of the fields. There's no type information there. Um, and this is constructed as a sub-assembly, sub which is a, a component that you can plug together with other components to construct a flow. Um, so to actually run this as a MapReduce job, you'd have to connect it to some um, source taps and some sync taps, but that's quite a kind of trivial operation. So I'll just put the, the main computational um, bit in here. Um, so you take these, these pipes as the input, and then you've got a kind of chained constructor, build objects inside objects inside objects, um, method to, to make your pipeline, which means you have certain guarantees about um, which, way it's, which way the data is going to flow and prevents you from doing loops and stuff. So um, you start with your track plane messages. Um, this is saying the keys that you want to join on and that it's an inner join. That's quite obvious. Um, but all these constructors just take in pipes of any kind. A co-group is a type of pipe, or each is a type of pipe. So there's no type safety in this case about what you're putting in. Um, so yeah, we, we do another co-group co to join. I've actually missed out the join type specification here, but um, the default is in a join, so I'm safe. 
Um, and then I've got this canonicalized step, um, it's just to explain how uh, transformation functions work. But that's like if you've got beetles and the beetles, you kind of want to resolve them to the same thing. That was kind of the idea about this step. Um, so yeah, you want to do some kind of transformation before you do the final aggregation. And there's an aggregation step which counts everything. It replaces, uh, creates a new field called count. Then we've got these two ones which I call the kind of pipe shaping uh, methods. We've got something called a retain, which discards all fields which aren't the ones that are mentioned. And you've got a, a rename, which renames the fields that you've got into some new names. So it's all kind of quite logical, but it is also quite verbose. And it looks a bit weird, I find. Um, yeah, let's stay on that a second. Um, yeah, it looks a bit unusual. It's not, it's not really familiar as any kind of data processing language that you might have seen before. Um, you've got all these constructors everywhere and these fields objects and they're, they're kind of using objects and types in a way that seems a bit unusual um, if you're not used to how it looks. Um, so this is the canonical artist function. These are how custom UDFs look like in cascading. Um, the actual the, core, the, the only implementation part of this is here. This is my uh, substitute for a real um, canonicalization function. It just converts it to lowercase. So you're correcting for case and nothing else. But as you can see, you've got a lot of crap around it. Um, all this, these uh, yeah, parts of the, the operation that you've got to define in cascading. So part of this is this bit, which says I'm expecting one argument, and this is my return type. And that's necessary for the kind of pre-execution um, validity check that cascading does before it sends it to the cluster. Um, and then you've got this kind of overhead to support zero or more return types. Um, so you can add more than one tuple for each operation. Um, but it means that it starts looking a little bit messy. Um, you also have this hideousness. Um, <laughs> because the author of cascading in my opinion, doesn't really understand how generic should work. So if you're writing cascading code, you'll end up with a lot of just, I'll oh, just put object in it and keep the type system happy because um, it's not really, it doesn't really match up with any notion of how type should work in this situation. Um, so yeah, building and testing in cascading is really easy. You can just build a jar, throw it at the cluster, run it with Hadoop. Um, custom functions, like I showed you, are reasonably easy, even though their syntax is a bit odd. Um, integration testing full flows is quite simple. You can just have memory taps and memory syncs and flow stuff through it and just kind of works. And it does this, this fields check that I mentioned, which is it's kind of equivalent of checking that the types are compatible. So um, yeah, if, if you're trying to generate something with a field that doesn't exist yet, then it's going to throw up an error. So it does some kind of sanity checking before you run it, which is advantageous because you don't use up resources running something that isn't going to work. So cascading, it's quite testable. You've got high-level operations. You don't need to define intermediate types. And by that, I mean um, if, you've, if you've done some kind of reshaping operation, you don't need a, another type definition there. Um, have generalized transformations. So if you want to apply a function to one field, it's not a separate it's not a different transformation to if you want to apply that same transformation to a different field. Um, on the downside, the custom UDFs have this odd syntax. Can be quite ugly, and by ugly I mean not what you expect from when you're writing code. It's quite verbose. You don't necessarily save that much on writing your MapReduce implementation, apart from joins, which are just hideous in MapReduce. Um, and it's not type safe to any extent, really. So. As a response to some of those criticisms, Twitter came up with this thing called Scalding, which is a scalar, 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 Scala API built on top of cascading. Um, and it looks very different. It's built on top of cascading, but it's kind of quite a heavy abstraction on top of it. It uses cascading to do the computation for it, but uh, it, it's not kind of really indicative of the way cascading builds its flows. So it looks very different, um, but it has the same concepts of pipes and taps and flows for transforming data and sourcing data and syncing data. Um, so this is the, the same example that I presented before, but written as a scalding, scalding job. Um, as you can see, it's wreaked havoc with my syntax highlighter, because uh, 
doesn't like the single quote. So in Scala, single quote means a, a literal symbol, but uh, you don't close it ever, so it thinks it's a string. But if you ignore that, then uh, you've got something that's kind of very similar in uh, effect. It's just a lot more compact. So these symbols constitute the field definitions. Um, and then we're sourcing it from somewhere, and we're joining. This join with smaller means we're expecting the right-hand side to be smaller than the left-hand side, which means the left-hand side will get streamed in the reducer, and the right-hand side will get loaded into memory. Um, and then same joining against the track ID. We're doing this canonical mapping, which thanks to uh, lambdas being a thing in Scala, becomes a lot prettier. Then this projection step is just cutting the tuple stream, so we only want those two things. Um, doing this size operation, which just counts the number, and then renaming it to the fields we want. In fact, there's a mistake here, because that should be rename country. Oh, no, maybe. Yeah, we're just renaming those two, so we still keep streams. It's OK. We're safe. Um, so yeah, it's uh, much more readable, compact, than cascading. has lots of useful built-in stuff, more than you'd normally get with cascading. Um, a tuple symbol model means it doesn't play so well with your IDE. You're not going to get many hints from there. It's just kind of, it'll, it'll, it'll highlight things, and it'll, uh, it'll give you some kind of indication of the methods that are available. But in terms of the data types you're working with, it's not going to help you out. And I've put a negative here that it requires Scala knowledge, because I think it's kind of worth bearing in mind that if you've got an organization of 1,000 Java programmers, and 10 of them know Scala, and you decide to write, rewrite all your data pipelines in Scala, then you're going to have a lot bigger problems if something goes wrong and you can't repurpose people. So it's, it's worth bearing in mind that if you branch out into a different language, you lose competence. Um, so in contrast to that, we have the Crunch family. The Crunch family are a lot younger than the, the Cascading family. Um, I think graduated, or what do you call it, from uh, incubating, Apache incubating in 2012, I think. Um, and they go for a typed functional model. Um, so strong types, and everything looks like functional transformations. So it's all based on these, these lazy collections, essentially. Um, you take something that looks a bit like collect, a collection and apply transformations on it, and at the end, you tell it to materialize your result or write your result to a file or, or something. So um, the kind of the main input type is a is a P collection. So the T is whatever typed record you're working with. Um, and then you can take a key out of that, and then you end up with a P table, which is key and value representation. If you collect all the values in a P table, you end up with a P grouped table. Um, and then you can collapse those back to tables and collections and write them out to disk. Um, so I guess if you're looking at um, kind of comparison with MapReduce, you can do map tasks that stay in P collection. You can do a map task which identifies a key. And then as you're yielding from your mapper to your reducers, you turn a P table into a P grouped table. Um, and then your reducer can do operations on the group table to turn it back into a table or a collection. Um, and because of the way these types are constructed, it means you've got you've got a static type safety all the way along the lines, which is has various benefits for certain situations. And then we've got these map functions, which just take one type and transform to another type, and a combined function which takes a key and an iterable of values and turns it into a key and value. So that's what I was talking about—the ones that collapse the grouped uh, concepts into the to the ungrouped concepts. So. Back to the same example. There's a lot of code in this. Um, <laughs> so we start with, as you can see, the big difference here is we've got types, 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 types everywhere. Um, the type definitions are on the next page. You'll see them. But um, So we've got um, our messages, our user infos, our metadatas. So here we say we're going to do an inner join. Um, this is a, a key function that I've identified. I've written into my type definition, which pulls out the username. This bit is a failure of Java's type inference. Um, if it was sensible, you could infer that from the fact you started with something that was typed and stored in Avro in the first place. But this example is kind of assuming that all your data is stored in Avro format. Um, 
But in the intermediate things, anytime you create a new field, you need to tell it how to store it when it does a map reuse cycle for it. Um, so yeah, and we're saying we want to join that with user info that's also keyed by username and is also a string so it can match up the keys. Um, and that produces a, a P table of a string and a pair of these. So we still got we still got the type available, and then we take the values. So we discard the key and just take the values of that. So we've got a collection of pairs. Then we do the same thing again to join to the artist country streams. This time we're joining by a track ID, which is an int and an int. Uh, again, we've got these um, key functions baked into the types. We take the values of that, so we end up with a pair of a pair of a track played message user info and an artist country streams, which is where the strongly typed model starts to get a bit confusing. Um, but yeah, then we can do these custom methods that we've also defined. Uh, this is wait, hold on. yeah, this is a a just a map function that collapses those nested pairs into the key that we want for our our aggregation. Um, and this reflects means it's going to reflect that class to try and figure out what the Avro schema is for it. Um, then we're counting them, which is going to create a pair of that key and an int. And then the final mapper is collapsing the pair of the key and the int into the target record type, which is artist country streams. Um, so that is a lot of types. This is just one of the type definitions. And in the actual code, there's um, four of them. Um, so you end up with a lot of type definitions for everything, and you end up having to write methods like this, which are kind of silly because this, this Java, you've got to, if you want to, have a single interface to fill out one field type, you've got to write a whole implementation for it. Um, but, wait, um, yeah, let's go on to this. Um, so testing, because of this strongly typed model, becomes really intuitive. Um, so this P collection, it doesn't have to be a file on a disk or something that's being read from a file on a disk. You can actually, using this mem pipeline thing, just put a real collection of stuff in there. So um, we've got these messages here, and these um, artists, and these right, these track metadata, and this music, uh, this user info data. And the test just becomes, OK, let's compute the streams with that and materialize it. And then we can assert compared to something else. Um, yeah, this, uh, wait, are we? What did I do? Oh, I didn't actually populate this. <laughs> this array list of the expected, so of course that test's going to fail. I was wondering why it didn't look quite right. But yeah, your expected ones would be just be generated in the same way, and then you could assert that. Um, clearly got lazy somewhat, some point in writing the examples. Um, yeah, so crunch, advantages, real types, which mostly an advantage, but can be a problem. Um, we've got great ID support because of your real types. I mean, you press dot, and you know what you can do. Um, everyone who writes Java loves that. Control space, control space, control space. Write your whole program. <laughs> uh, testing is really easy. It's got built-in Avro support, which is important for us because we type all our data with Avro and Spotify, so that's a kind of win for us. Um, and But the, the downsides here are these verbose type definitions that I showed you. Um, especially as you need to kind of do those for every intermediate step, unless you want to end up with these weird compound types all over the place. Um, and Java has no lambdas, so those functions end up really ugly and verbose. Um, the documentation for Crunch is awful. I've started writing some better documentation um, based on what I've learned in my discovery, but I've been mining source code to figure out how to do just basic things. Um, and Java's type inference is sometimes not up to the job. So where you saw those, oh wait, these Avros things, um, that's a, as a result of type inference. And here, because I want to map the first of a pair with a function, it can't infer that the second part of the pair is irrelevant. So I've got to specify that the second part of the pair is a user info, even though I'm not using it. That kind of thing is is part of Java's type inference. So some of those problems solved by Java 8, because uh, you have lambdas and better type inference. Some of them not. So 
in addition to crunch, you have a thing called scrunch, which is technically a little bit experimental at the moment, but it's, uh, it's starting to look a little bit more, more mature at the moment. Uh,